Hello and welcome to today's session of uh, Phenomics webinars. This webinar series is organized by the European Infrastructure Access Project EPPN 2020, the European Research Infrastructure Emphasis and the International Plan Phenotyping Network. My name is Philipp von Gillhausen and welcome to Phenomics webinars. Today we will Having, we will be having uh, two guests here uh, together with me. Uh, one guest is uh, Karen Moschelian. Our joint speaker for today is Alexis Kumar. Karen is uh, on herself the CEO of the company Plant Ditech. Um, and uh, Alexis is the CEO of the French uh, phenotyping and image analysis uh, company Hyphen. Welcome to today's meeting. Um, before we begin, um, we will ha be having um, some sort of uh, differences uh, for today's uh, Phenomics webinars as we will be playing a pre-recorded video um, which I'm going to start very, very soon. But um, before, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, commencing with uh, Karen Moschelian. Karen uh, studied economics and business management uh, at the Tel Aviv and the Technikion um, universities in Israel. Her field of expertise is information systems management. After her studies, she uh, spent 12 years at Indigo Limited, uh, afterwards um, worked for five years uh, in different consulting uh, businesses uh, for business development. Before, in 2016, she founded um, uh, or she took the, the uh, role of a CEO at the um, company Plant Ditech, where she's uh, been working up to today. Since then, the company achieved a worldwide presence in over 10 countries and their product is now being used by top universities, uh, by top leading food companies such as Mars and Wrigley's and chemical or biostimulant companies uh, such as ICL with over 30 scientific papers published so far. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Philippe. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to everybody here today and looking forward to the session. No, it's my pleasure to have you, Karen. Um, before we go on, uh, of course, I want to introduce our um, co-speaker that he, uh, is going to present today together with Karen. Um, his name, as I said, is Alexi Kuma. Um, Alexi, before he uh, became CEO of uh, Haifen, he did his PhD at the uh, Arvalis Institute in France um, with a topic on field phenotyping, then went over to his uh, postdoc at INRAE, um, where he concentrated more on light interception and um, bonded strongly with his mentor and uh, later co-founder Fred Beret, who uh, jointly founded the company Hyphen in 2014 together with Alexis. And since then, uh, Alexis has already uh, has led the company as a CAO. His aim was to make plant phenotyping or is to make plant phenotyping and crop image analysis uh, widely available among researchers and practitioners in France, the US and worldwide. His goal is to help develop varieties, processes and products that will secure the food supply and create more sustainable and profitable options for farmers and the agricultural ecosystems around the world. Welcome Alexis. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I don't want to waste any more time um, before we can dive into uh, the presentation of Karen and Alexis. Enjoy the ride and we'll see each other afterwards for our Q&A session.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar of the IPPN series. We would like to thank Philip for the invitation, and we're going to speak today about water use efficiency and finding the best uh, trade off between productivity and survivability. Uh, today with us um, is myself, Alexis Comor, and Kiren Mouchillon. Hello, Kiren. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So, I am the CEO of Hyphen, and uh, Karen is the CEO of PlanDiTech, and we're very happy to be here today. Uh, so who is Hyphen? Hyphen is a company specialized in plant measurements through a wide variety of sensors, from satellites to drones to phenomobiles to smartphones or to embedded um, sensors on the field. We're able to measure any type of metrics from plant counts, uh, organs counts, um, architectural data, etc., on any types of crops. And so we really work um, in the very various um, use cases. Uh, today, we're a company based in France with uh, US offices. We work uh, on the five continents. So uh, among our main and valuable uh, customers, we can cite Summit, INRAE, University of Queensland, and the University of Tokyo, uh, but we also work with the agro-industries, so people like Mochonon, um, etc., on always the same type of topics, which is how to measure plants uh, for their use cases. And now let's go on to Plant Dietech. Thank you, Alexei. So Plant Dietech uh, is delivering a high-throughput phenotyping solution. Uh, the technology was developed at the Hebrew University in Israel by two professors, uh, one expert in plant physiology, the other is in uh, soil and water sciences. Uh, we are uh, from Israel and um, we licensed the technology and we're commercial since 2017 with already global presence in uh, nine different countries. And uh, there are over 30 scientific art articles that were published using our solution. Uh, some examples of our customers are uh, Wageningen University um, and uh, some distinguished customers like Göttingen, Wageningen, Florida and more. And also on the um, uh, industry side, we work with uh, our customer base, uh, food and chemical companies like Moss, Wrigley, ICL and, and others. Um, so uh, our solution is for a high th throughput phenotyping indoor in the greenhouse or in the uh, growth chambers um, and we are performing functional phenotyping which is physiological screening of the plant on a plant level plant by plant level uh, measuring all the plants at once uh, simultaneously all along the day in very high resolution uh, and we perform a quick screening so within days uh, up to weeks, you can uh, get the results of your experiment, and this is versus full seasons in the field. Um, and uh, we do three main things, uh, all in parallel, all auto uh, automatic, control the sun and water of the plants, uh, measure the plants physiologically and also environmental analysis, together with uh, analyzing it in real time, uh, and including statistics. And the outcome is that uh, we predict the plant performance with high correlation to yield results in the field. Thank you, Karen. So today's talk is about some, some ideas on how to monitor water use efficiency uh, in, in a quite um, efficient way at the same time in the field and the greenhouses. So we were, were going to start by speaking a little bit uh, about the issues and what's at stake for the water use efficiency. Then we will focus on how we can go from the uh, greenhouse to the field or from the field to the greenhouses. And uh, then we will go into more details on how we can assess this type of, uh, this type of measurement at the same time in the field and in the greenhouses. So let's, go on, let, let's get on with it. Um, so why? Uh, Water use efficiency is uh, such a big issue today. Well, mainly uh, because drought is really a topic that is getting more and more um, importance uh, due 
to global warming due to irrigation issues where we're having um, more and more crops that are irrigated <laughs> with less and less uh, water resources to be able to irrigate them. And so all the game nowadays is how are we going to be able to maintain our yields with uh, less, less water and more extreme environments um, to perform those, uh, those high yields that we're doing today. So um, it takes today a long time to breed for drought tolerance. It's a very long process, 20 to 25 years. And we also see that there are few results in the field, uh, few solutions, few, few products out there. Um, and also research, just uh, research on the topics also take a lot of time. And one of the main bottlenecks for this is really the ability to measure the crop uh, physiological, complex physio uh, traits, physiological traits such as uh, water efficiency and other functional traits, and then correlate them to genetic information, genetic data. Uh, most of this is because physiological traits are measured mainly today still manually or by plant by plant, uh, and so it's a very slow process. So, um, in order to go into the definitions a little bit, and of course definitions is always uh, um, something that can be discussed and, and different teams uh, can, can make them very little bit, but for us what is water use efficiency? is the amount of water needed to make um, uh, yield, <laughs> to make a quantity of yield. So then yield can be uh, divided uh, into biomass and harvest index. Water use can be divided in evaporation, transpiration, and losses you're going to have. Uh, but basically, uh, that's all what we're going to discuss about is how do you use the water in order to achieve your yield. Uh, and for that, uh, there's many processes at stake in the plant that are um, going to control and to improve the quantity of water you're going to use to achieve your yield. Uh, it can be either the, the stomatal conductance, but also the capacity of the roots to extract water, the quantity of fruits, etc. So there's many, many processes. Uh, involved in this water use efficiency, and that's really what we're going today to, to focus on how we can try to disentangle all those processes to find the most efficient plants. Uh, looking at water use efficiency alone is also not enough. Uh, in order to learn uh, the ability of, of the plants to be resistant to drought, we need also to evaluate the productivity of the plant versus its survivability. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, you can see that uh, here are two examples. Uh, one is with the um, uh, sunflower and the other with the cactuses. So sunflower is just an example for uh, uh, bread, breaded uh, field crops. And the uh, cactuses for those plants that are living in harsh environments like uh, with uh, low water amounts. And what we can see, uh, of course, the sunflower and such uh, field crops were designed to produce more yield. Uh, and this is what they do. They produce more yield. When we look at their stomata activity, uh, we can see that their stomata is mostly open. They produce and they do a lot of photosynthesis. And uh, transpiration is also very high. So they lose a lot of water. So uh, they're also taking a risk. What will happen tomorrow? Uh, when there is no rain, um, and how will they cope with that when they lose a lot of water? On the other hand, we have the, those uh, plants that are uh, living in harsh environments. Uh, they developed a mechanism where their water use efficiency is very high, but the production is low. So photosynthesis is low, their stomata is, is more closed. Uh, they're not losing a lot of water, not doing a lot of transpiration but water use efficiency is high, but production is low. So what we would like to do in the, uh, and what is better to try to achieve in the uh, process of uh, finding tolerant plants uh, to drought is really to find a balance between the two. Uh, water use efficiency, but also look at uh, this balance between productivity and survivability. And we'll explain how we do that in the next session. 
Thank you, Ken. So um, now let's focus on how um, vision we're having to go from field to greenhouses uh, in regards really to this water use ap efficiency applications with uh, hyphen and plan detect tools. So, so the first thing uh, we would like to mention that it seems to me really important is scalability. So the ability to measure a lot of plants, especially in nurseries, can nowadays be achieved in the field. And, and, and this is something that is um, really <laughs> new and massive uh, with digital tools. On the other hand, being able at the plant level to measure a full plant array system, by example, uh, the, um, the processes of a, of a wide variety of plants is also um, arriving to maturity. So that's why we do believe that there can be combination in two sides. Karen? So the way we uh, propose in this presentation is that you can go from the lab, from the genetics towards screening, uh, doing an efficient uh, screening of physiological complex traits in the greenhouse, uh, measuring on a plant level and trying to find what is the, to do a simulation, what is the best uh, performing plant uh, based on physiological data. From that, going to the field and screening for uh, the best plants, and of course, matching it with genetic data. Uh, or do a reverse phenomics where you go from the field, you try with large quantities of plants with large uh, populations, and identifying those that have the potential, going back through the greenhouse to understand it on a plant level and to the uh, genetic uh, side link it to the genetic side in both cases, of course. So we offer here a two ways of approach, which makes the whole process very efficient. And we will present to you in the coming slides how we deal with the water use efficiency and other functional traits in the greenhouse and also in the field in both ways. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so, so let's go into how we now concretely evaluate that in the field. Um, and, and, and really, I love this idea of being able to do two ways and the digital tools are really allowing us um, to envision new ways of making uh, selections in, in this field. So first, um, what uh, I think is important to mention is nowadays we arrived at the maturity to be able to evaluate agroclimatic traits. What are agroclimatic traits? Agroclimatic traits are traits that combine at the same time plant data recorded by drones, phenomobiles, or other sensors uh, that take data in the field with climatic data like weather stations and soil data, uh, soil probes, etc. And mixing them together uh, allows you to get agroclimatic traits. I guess the most important one is what we call a QPAR, or the quantity of light intercepted through the season, or the energy that is intercepted for the light use efficiency. We can also mention plant phenology, so to be able to understand when each phenological stage arrives, and of course, uh, water use efficiency. So now on, we're going to focus on concretely, how do we manage to mix those data together to be able to have some insights on water use efficiency? Well. Um, I think it's really about an evapotranspiration assessment. So basically, we're able to have uh, an F cover, so a fraction of vegetation uh, on your microplot. By combining it with a water balance model and some consideration about your um, um, water availability in the soil, evapotranspiration and transpiration processes, you're able to extract traits about water stress. So let's get a glimpse about this water balance uh, model, how it works. Well, it's quite easy, actually. Yeah? It's really about considering that you're having some water availability on your soil, that some of this water is going to go for evaporation. Some will be able to be used by the plant for transpiration. This transpiration can be at maximal potential as long as you have a certain amount of water. Then it will lower down because there's not enough water to extract, so you will still have an evaporation, but um, a transpiration, but less. And finally, you arrive to this uh, uh, weak point where the, the plant dies. Um, and, and so all the game then is to say, okay, uh, how much does it rain? 
how much does my uh, plant um, transpirate, how much does my soil evaporate, uh, what are my water loss, and uh, I'm able to, to, to seal that. For evaporation and transpiration, we're using really those motif equations that are, I guess, quite standard uh, in, the, in, the, in our field that allows us, by comparing with what would happen with grass, uh, to, to, to evaluate the, the ATP, so the potential evapor transpiration, and we're able to transform uh, the ATP into a tier uh, through the water balance model, and, and we can discuss that further if you want. And, and that's really the idea on how with just some simple drone data and um, um, and um, climatic data, we're able to really go much further and give you some information that are comparable for us uh, sites across sites and that are really um, easier to handle it in a massive big data scale. Some concrete examples. Huh? Here you can see uh, the example of a plot that um, had actually a very strong vigor, a very strong initial vigor. This very strong initial vigor meant that you had an F cover that developed fast. So you had some uh, the ETP versus uh, the, the potential transpiration. So the potential uh, ETP versus the, the real um, ETP and special and transpiration uh, was soon uh, starting to, to to split, and you had water stress arriving extremely uh, rapidly. On the other side, this microplot, which had much less vigor, so where the F cover uh, started increasing much later in the season, meant that uh, your transpiration rate were lower, so you, you match your ETP for much longer, and stresses occurred later in the seasons. So you can really see the difference between those two, those two sites. Um, so that's the theory of this, uh, the way we are managing to compute water stress. Of course, and that's really, uh, really important, that this model tells you that we should have had water stress or not, doesn't mean that the plant stressed, because there's many other processes at play, like uh, the, the quantity of water availability in the soil, the roots, to extract this water availability, uh, the stomata distance that can be a little bit different, and that's exactly why you're ruling for those things, uh, which means that actually we need to disentangle was this stress a real stress or was the plant able to, it should have theoretical stress, but it didn't, and so it's a plant we want to target. For that, we can do canopy temperature assessment, so to look at if the plant um, is heating or not. If it's heating, it means um, transpiration is lower because the stomata are closing, and thus that it's starting to stress, or at least that the potential evaporation, evapotranspiration is not rich, and that uh, so your your real transpiration is much lower, which means that yes, it's stressing. You can also look at leaf rolling. So real, leaf rolling is an, also another um, trait that is uh, instantaneous, which is about limiting <laughs> the F cover, so limiting the surface of transpiration in order to uh, use less water and to be able to, to, to increase survivability. Uh, there's many other processes we could think about, um, typically fluorescence of, or, or other processes, which we don't yet measure, so, um, but we're working hard on. And then the first step is to say, okay, now that I have those agroclimatic traits, I know my stress and all that, I look actually at um, what yield I achieve compared to the stresses, to those agroclimatic traits, to look at efficiencies. And there is really um, those plants that has very strong, uh, even if the plant doesn't have uh, outstanding yield, if they have outstanding efficiencies, I do believe it's those plants you want to select and you want to understand why they're performing so well. So let's go um, just for a couple of minutes into those examples of instantaneous stress that I really think can complement those uh, water stress assessments we presented to you. The first one is temperature. So temperature is a really, really tricky trait to play with because soil is always much warmer than the canopy. So if you look at the global uh, temperature of your canopy, uh, you, you will be sensitive actually to the uh, F cover. So lower is your F cover, higher will be your temperature, higher is your F cover, uh, lower will be your temperature, 
whatever is the stomatal conductance. So we're working hard on trying to disentangle the soil to the to the, the soil's effect from the plant uh, heating up. Uh, there's already some papers uh, discussing about that, and I believe that the solutions will come with cameras with higher resolutions. Uh, the other point which um, um, I contributed for this publication is how can you assess leaf rolling for time? So today, there are some digital ways that are as good as uh, um, ma manual and visual scoring, and I'm really happy to discuss that in another webinar with you uh, in details. Uh, and yeah, and so once we are managing to have all that, is a moment where we say, okay, we did all this work, why not nurseries and tens of thousands of plots in a really digital way where we use big data, and I managed to find a certain number of cultivars of modalities that are outstanding. What do I do with it? Well, probably the first step will be to validate that it's really outstanding cultivars. Why not with plant detect systems? And uh, I give the hand to you, Karen. Thank you, Alexei. So, yeah, let's discuss how we validate this in the greenhouse. Um, so, uh, this is the plant array system. Uh, what we can see here is uh, an experiment in the greenhouse uh, on a single plant level uh, where there is a drought experiment. So the experiment goes automatically from the well irrigated uh, stage to drought and recovery. What you can see in the graph is a transpiration, a daily transpiration parameter, one of the parameters we are measuring. I will speak in a second about all the different ones. Uh, so uh, what we do in, the, in this uh, analysis, we uh, do physiological uh, tests. We retrieve physiological data from all the plants simultaneously and also on a continuous basis throughout the day. Uh, while we control different soil and water cocktails uh, or conditions to each of the plants. So you can do, you can provide different levels of uh, uh, water, uh, nutrients, salinity, uh, a combination of, the, of those uh, in your research. Uh, the system is working on the basis, uh, the principle of water movement and water measurement from the root activity of water influx uh, through the water balance within the plant and then the transpiration uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, so we are measuring the water use efficiency, but not only, we are also measuring the growth and productivity by the plant because productivity is measured by the transpiration rate. Transpiration is well known as uh, having a direct link to a photosynthesis. So as much as transpiration rate is going up, we will see also photosynthesis going up, photosynthesis activity, and therefore a yield going up. Uh, the, in this cartoon, we can see in an illustration how the system works, so supplying uh, different soil and water quantities, cocktails to each in individual plant. And on the right hand, hand side, you can see all the different parameters. So let's start with transpiration, uh, precise transpiration measured by the system, biomass, precise uh, biomass gain is measured uh, by the system, Water use efficiency, which is a derivative of transpiration uh, by the biomass, and, and root influx together with stomatal conductance. We will talk more and I will provide more examples. Uh, these, are, these physiological traits are measured together with um, the environment, and some of them has very valuable uh, relation to drought uh, testing. Uh, all of this uh, it can be done for different types of plants. We worked with many types so far, and uh, from a Arabidopsis level to even up to trees. Uh, I didn't mention, but all this uh, data goes into a cloud software, which then is being analyzed over there. So what we see here in this example, it's um, just an example of the different traits, biomass transpiration, stomatal conductance, drought resistance. We talked about the uh, how it's tough to do to organize the genetic ranking uh, when you do it, um, uh, the measurement on a plant by planet basis. And here it's just a quick display, uh, even during the experiment of the biomass, transpiration, stomatal conductance, and all that. 
Uh, this is on a, uh, tomatoes. Let's go to the next example. This is on tomato core. You can see on the left uh, hand side, transpiration rate, which is being measured on a daily pattern. You can see uh, the daily pattern and the difference between four different genotypes. And you can see that uh, if you don't measure the plants on a continual basis, actually you might lose some very important data about the behavior and the response of the plant. Uh, in this case, this is a gap between the upper genotype and the lower one at noon time accumulated on a day by day basis to 15% more yield. This was published, you can read the paper. Um, on the right hand side, you can see another parameter is the biomass gain, uh, how it's demonstrated again in tomato. Um, and the biomass gain measured during uh, well irrigation and during uh, drought. Uh, in this example, we now will focus more on the, about the water use efficiency trait. Uh, this is um, uh, taken from a paper published by uh, Wacheningen University. This is the setup at uh, Wacheningen. Uh, you can see uh, on the left hand side a daily pattern of two de consecutive uh, days. This is the light behavior. Uh, at, the, at the middle graph, you see the, how the transpiration is behaving, the transpiration rate. And you can see that it kind of follows the same pattern as we saw on the light, very similar pattern. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the water use efficiency, again, following very se similar pattern. But what you can see here, that for example, this red, a, a cultivar, uh, this red uh, uh, variety that was at the bottom with the low transpiration rate actually becomes uh, high rated in the water use efficiency. So the, the system is measuring all of this instantly during the experiment. Now we said that it's not enough to measure water use efficiency. We have to look also at productivity versus survivability. This is very important. The trait which is helping us to do that is the stomatal conductance. It is actually measuring this transpiration rate normalized to the plant biomass and to VPD. VPD is the vapor uh, pressure deficit. Uh, this parameter was also tested in different cases. It's also published. Uh, this is taken from the Wachingen paper where it has a very great fit, uh, 0.99 to the porometer measurement. Uh, let's look at the right hand side uh, graph. What we can see in the graph, we can see the radiation, the line in red, and then we see in green the VPD. Uh, we can see that the uh, VPD is low during the morning and uh, during noon time it's getting higher, which is not surprising. And then we see the stomatal conductance behavior in blue. Uh, what we see is that there is a certain peak, a very high peak uh, during the day. And this is because uh, in this time of the day, the plant is using, is, is most efficient, is producing uh, much more. Uh, the production is high, but is losing a low amount of water. This is the most productive time. This is the, actually, this is the balance between the productivity and survivability we discussed before. Now, of course, you can measure that with the system for each of the plants on a plant basis. And you can compare between the plants and see who is having this trait in the most uh, uh, most uh, high rate and compare between all the different plants. Uh, we tested the system in the greenhouse and with the same cultivars also in the uh, field. We see very high correlation between the greenhouse and the field. You can see the graphs here in well irrigation and in stress, you can see the same behavior and a very high uh, rate of correlation. So in summary, uh, we, uh, in, with the plant array system, you can measure in the greenhouse uh, or in the growth chamber, uh, the water use efficiency activity and also um, the stomatal conductance activity compared to all of the plants simultaneously uh, and continuously. And what we, you can do is either screen in the greenhouse for a simulation and then go to the field with the best plants, or in a reverse way, 
do the trial in the first in the field and go into more uh, after you have the discovery into more um, uh, thorough study in the greenhouse. Thank you, um, Jan. So uh, I guess really the takeaway home message here is that for really arriving at maturity to have professional digital tools to accelerate drought research. Um, and, and that's really important because today we still have a sensation that it's researchers that are making amazing research on, on one specific topic and that the tools, the overall tools at the same time in the greenhouses and in the field were still a little bit lacking or lacking of maturity, let's say. Uh, today, uh, companies like Pandaitech and Hyphen and of course a lot of others are starting really to have some some scalable tools uh, for you to make your research in a real professional way and, and, and we're really happy to discuss that further with you and to see how we can help you scale your project, scale your, your um, yeah, your breeding programs in order to lower the time where you can have products into the field uh, to the farmers. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, because Karen and I would be really happy to, to discuss further about all what we discussed up to now. Please don't forget, um, we're here to help and you can reach us whenever you want. So thank you very much, Karen and Alexis, and welcome uh, here now live with us, um, opening the Q&A. Um, Hello, Karen. Hello, Alexi. Hi. Hello there. <laughs> Are you here? Can you uh, maybe enable your video? I'm trying, but it doesn't let me. So I'll be happy to share my video. Yep. I'm sure you will be able to do this now. Hello. Uh, here we are. <laughs> hey, glad to see you in live. Uh, and thank you very, very much for this excellent presentation we just saw now with the field to greenhouse approach, uh, a little bit uh, the other way around, as most people usually know that. But uh, very intriguing, very, very interesting approach, um, very much data driven, which uh, I always like. And uh, I'm glad that you uh, presented this here uh, for us today. So I will not lose much time, uh, but right away dive into the, up, uh, the questions that came up um, during the talk. Are you ready? Yep. Great. So first question comes from Stephanie. She's asking, are the same genotypes grown in the greenhouse and the field? If so, how did the two correlate? So did you observe similar um, effect sizes and directions in, in both environments? Yes, definitely. Um, we, we've seen a very nice correlation, very high correlation, uh, especially when uh, we talk about well irrigated conditions, but also, uh, and we compared the, the transpiration that was measured in the greenhouse and uh, in the field with, uh, with actual yields. And we saw that there is a, um, it was around the 0.95, 0.94, these are the numbers correlation when, when it was well irrigated uh, in terms of the correlation. And then we also, of course, looked at stress. So when it was stressed, it was uh, around the uh, above 0 0.8, 0 0.2, it depends on the uh, different uh, trials, but uh, all in all, very nice uh, correlation to field results and uh, uh, were shown in different cases, different crops. Um, uh, so it's quite consistent. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, our squares of 0.9 are quite remarkable. However, you just said um, that you at least um, experienced a very, very slight reduction in our square um, when the treatment, so the drought set in. So drought is a very complex uh, or uh, environment to, to recreate artificially uh, because it's not only um, involving heat, but also irradiance. Uh, and of course, uh, the humidity plays a role. All these factors are certainly very, very 
um, difficult to recreate like they are in, in the natural environment. So do you think this is the reason uh, to have uh, a slightly reduced R square when the treatment uh, onset begins? Yeah, because uh, uh, exactly because we also have a, a very good control when we do the the, the treatment when we apply the treatment itself, but also uh, and uh, we can do it very precisely uh, and with a certain you know with the this is the one element, but also other element is the the way that we treat the pot and how we deal with a lot of different aspects, uh, small aspects, but they are becoming big when you handle it all together. It's, uh, it has an effect, it's a, a positive effect, uh, where you handle the things that relate to pot effects. So the pot effects are really minimized in our system. Uh, we a lot of thought, a lot of experience that went into the system uh, using uh, pot trials, um, doing pot trials with our, uh, with the, um, uh, a lot of years of experience that uh, went into it. So uh, all these different elements uh, makes it more uh, in correlation to what is uh, happening in the field. So um, uh, the, there are different elements like the way we can uh, get rid of excess water and the way we irrigate uh, a lot of different elements. I will not now start to uh, go over them here, but uh, a lot of thought went into that, and uh, yeah, it comes uh, as a result uh, in the results uh, at the end of the day. Comes mm -hmm. into yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, next question, uh, from, from uh, Irena Bora Serrano. Um, she's asking, How is cover measured or estimated? Is it with a drone and which type of sensor uh, in brackets, RGB or multispectral? Thanks. Um, yes, so how did you measure or estimate the, the, the crop cover or the... Yeah, so in this webinar, we, um, we used the F cover based on uh, RGB drones with uh, image segmentation. So image segmentations versus three ways to, to make uh, image uh, segmentation, which is basically finding a threshold on a vegetation index like excess green or vary. Uh, we, in this webinar, it was an F cover based on a, a random forest algorithm, so which is also um, pixel classification. And more and more, there's deep learning algorithm of segmentation tools. So, so I think it's the easiest way to do it. And DVI with multi-spectral drone can also do the trick. So we could have done it this way, but it was not the case as multi-spectral drones are more expensive and can have often less data, less information than RGB. Um, and, and what is going coming more and more now for drone uh, understanding is LIDARs, as it gives you a better understanding of which are the leaves that have direct uh, sunlight from the leaves that have indirect sunlight. So, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, today we did simple RGB drones for segmentation. Tomorrow we can do things much, much more um, precise to also be able to see uh, the delta of growth uh, on top of it. Uh, I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm confident that if not, uh, then follow-up questions will pop up. However, uh, until this, uh, we'll get to the next questions um, asked by Katharina Huntenburg. Um, she's asking, how do you mitigate the, the pot effect? So we know that pots have a, uh, an effect on plant growth, like Porter et al. Um, had extensively showed in their papers. So how do you circumvent this uh, effect um, in comparison to your field trials where you don't have pots? So if I understand correctly, uh, the question, um, so the way we uh, deal, so it's, if I understand cor cor correctly, it's very similar to the previous question, or is it the, the reason? Mm -hmm. the, the, the essence of the question, I think, falls back to um, if you compare plants growing in natural environment in the, in the soil without pots, so just in the free, free rooting space, 
Yeah. yeah. How, how do you account for the pot effect that you have in the greenhouse, but not in the in the field? Yeah. So it's yeah. So it's quite similar, but I can detail it more because I see there is a need from the audience. So um, we deal with that with many ways. Uh, we deal with that with uh, the drainage system that we have uh, a, a unique drainage system. Uh, with the uh, uh, leaching injection injectors that we have in the system uh, to make it more, more um, scattered around the pot and not just in, uh, let's say, one, one area. Uh, we have some unique covers uh, for the pot. Uh, we have a certain pot isolation. Um, and, um, and so uh, we can uh, prevent certain things from happening that... Uh, that is very much uh, like heating and so forth, uh, which is in a greenhouse. So we try to imitate as much the, the field conditions. And uh, uh, for example, one of the things uh, that happen is about um, uh, the, the water, uh, the amount of water in the pot, right? So uh, we have, because we, we are able to control that. Uh, so we have the full control of what is happening within the pot we can plan also the, the experiments accordingly. So it really imitates what's happening in the field. Uh, we have a special controller for that, that uh, actually can do all these different things. Uh, we have uh, um, also uh, uh, adopters for a variety of, uh, you know, of, uh, we have also, by the way, pot size that is different. We can have bigger and smaller. So it all depends really on the experiment, uh, the type of uh, plant, but um, that we can adjust for the pot size, for example, and uh, a lot about the irrigation handling in the system, which is uh, very smart in order to cope with the field conditions. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. So all these um, pre-assumptions that went into the design of the plant array technology are uh, already taken into account that pot or potted plants um, undergo some 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 specific um, um, influences just by the pots and and you did a, try to account for in um, as many as possible. So yeah, one more thing, if I may, we also uh, constantly measure the feedback from the plant, mm -hmm. so we can uh, adapt the irrigation automatically by the system to the actual consumption by the plant. So we know exactly by the system, exactly how the plant is reacting. And based on that, the irrigation is also uh, set up based on what we wanted to achieve in the experiment. So all of this is taken into account. So it's all based on the plant, the actual plant feedback and not just by, uh, you know, a, a certain setup, but really, uh, it's not deterministic, it's really changing by the plant uh, reaction, by the plant response, and each plant is reacting usually differently, so it's really a, a kind of a personalized uh, uh, touch for the plant in order really to imitate uh, what is happening in the field. Yes, it's really dynamic, and you can, while monitoring the plant reaction, uh, take, take it into account, while, for example, the plant growth or the canopy develops, and and this certainly poses a different uh, uh, or, or or different demands in in terms also of the water supply or nutrient supply and so on. It's great that you can do this with this system. So I hope, Katharina, that this uh, answers your questions. We'll be moving on to the question of B. Kiat Neo. He's asking or she is asking more on time window and reflection. Do you use temperature depression instead of canopy temperature? Uh, I'm not sure I understand very well the question. Uh, so when we speak about canopy temperature, we're discussing about uh, sensors, so thermal cameras that are embedded on UAVs or eventually uh, other type of um, vectors such as phenomobiles. So for me, it's canopy temperature. But, but I'm happy to discuss that further to, to better understand the question. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, um, 
I'm sharing I sharing the the, the same uh, feeling towards this. Um, what I could uh, imagine is that it um, it targets towards um, how you are taking the the uh, canopy or leaf temperature um, within that trial and uh, whether you really directly measure it via thermal imagery, for example, or if you have some kind of proxy to to get to the to, to the canopy temperature. Yeah, so so canopy temperature is a real issue <laughs> uh, to be sent to be measured in the field, uh, basically because thermal cameras are not cooled down. So which means that there's a uh, heavy uncertainties on the measurements, which is not that big of an issue when you want to detect a human being or to see uh, if a house is having some heat sink or things like that. But are a big issue when you want to see uh, very small differences. Um, of, of uh, leaf temperature linked to stomatal conductance. So, so, so today it's still ongoing research. Uh, we can add on top of that that we need a lot of resolution with a thermal camera to be able to dissociate the soil from the canopy, as the soil is always way warmer than the canopy. So the first driver of uh, uh, a microplot temperature is VF cover. And this we always need to keep that in mind. Huh? Uh, uh, the, the canopy temperature is directly linked to VF cover. Uh, so that's why we need big resolution. But we can discuss that further because indeed it gives you a good indication of, um, if we had a good temperature, it would give you a good indication of stomatal conductance, which is very linked to VPD. So, so and, and, and that's where we have this uh, vapor uh, pressure deficit. And when I see depression, I'm wondering if it's not what uh, uh, BCAT is suggesting. So, so I'm, I'm really happy to discuss that further uh, uh, by precising the question. Okay, thank you very much, Alexis. Andrew Weeks is asking, this is, uh, approach is very attractive to research facilities. Do you see increasing interest from private companies such as plant breeders or large scale intensive horticultural producers? It would seem to have a good place in terms of a competitive advantage for these companies. Yes, uh, definitely. We have customers from this space and we have discussions with potential customers from this space. So definitely there is a, 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 an interest, an increased interest uh, coming from the food seed um, area. Uh, so we definitely see that. Uh, it helps them to shorten their uh, uh, breeding time cycle uh, and also to increase the quality of the results because uh, a lot of time uh, when they go to the field trials, they don't know exactly what to expect and uh, it fine tunes the field trials much better when you do uh, a first uh, more controlled uh, uh, experiment in the greenhouse and then you go to the field. Uh, and also vice versa, if you want to deepen your understanding about uh, how the plant, uh, actually the, the mechanism about the plant, why it responded as it responded, going back to the genetics. So definitely uh, in these two ways, uh, it's happening. Yeah. And maybe on the high hyphen side, we universities are small customers for us. So it's mainly with the private companies we work. And, and we're, of course, happy to work more with them. Uh, but, but yes, so, so indeed, it, it's, it's with breeders that we do such things. Thank you very much, uh, both to Karen and Alexis. Uh, going on with the next uh, question from Chi Kang Ti. Thanks for this excellent talk, Karen and Alexis. How do you normalize noise from light and wind over time when measuring leaf temperature in the field? Are you using infrared thermal imaging? Thank you. So, so this, I guess, is for me. Uh, th this is a great question, which is not completely solved. Uh, one of the way um, we're doing currently when we're making a thermal measurement is to make sure that with drone or with plane, you're having a heavy overlap. And this heavy overlap, um, uh, full time as well allows you to have the temperature of your microplots um, at different times during your acquisition se session. And so you can see at least the range of the temperature of your microplots through the whole 
acquisition session and you can see which uncertainty you're you're catching now this uncertainty uh, is linked indeed to the wind to uh, those environmental effects but also to the camera that is having a calibration that is also a little bit um, sometimes uh, questionable so 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 uh, and uncertainties can go up to two degrees around from our experience so um <coughs> We are able to sort the, the, the worst and the, the best. Uh, then in the middle, it's always a little bit more tricky, but, but we're happy to discuss that further and to show you a little bit how we're managing at Hyphen. Hmm. Do you maybe know an easy uh, solution to this? So um, maybe easy, but not so accurate for, for example, taking min and max values um, of that range you were just saying, or are you, are you, um, on thermal, on thermal images, we don't have yet easy solutions. If we had, I think they would be published and uh, and everyone would be using them. Uh, today, we're still trying to figure out uh, what are the uncertainty we can cope with and what are the uncertainty we cannot cope with. And and I think, I mean, at least I haven't read um, in the in the bibliography anything uh, really firm. And uh, I think we're all experiencing some trouble, so we always think we have some good solutions like uh, calibration around the fields or stuff like that. And we're always having some uh, drawbacks in one or another experiment. So unfortunately, I wish I had some easy stuff, uh, Philip, but, but I have nothing to share. Uh, um. Yes, I understand. Uh, I mean, this is a problem that has been there from the beginning of uh, thermal imagery in agriculture and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a uh, an issue. It's quite an issue. Next question uh, comes from an anonymous uh, viewer. Uh, soil temperature and soil oxygen levels have been factored? Question mark. I guess uh, this is. I'll start. I don't know if it's also for Alexi, but. Uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, a lot. The basic system already, uh, we have atmospheric sensing and the plant sensing, but we have also extra sensors. Uh, we have uh, soil sensors that we are adding um, and um, uh, to the system. We have many types of sensors, not only these two that you mentioned, uh, that the uh, anonymous uh, attendee mentioned, but also uh, many other a type of uh, sensor that can be added to the system, like, for example, NDVI, PRI, IR, uh, pH, uh, uh, wind, uh, a lot of different. Uh, so you can really learn about the interaction from the, between the environment and the plant. This is the essence of the technology, yes. Uh, I see there was also another question about stomatal conductance that we skipped. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was just about to to um, to, to uh, mention this one. Uh, we can right away um, go over to this. Um, the question is, how do you measure stomatal conduct conductance in the greenhouse? What is was it done automatically or manually? Yeah, so totally automatically. Uh, it's a good question. I will explain. Um, uh, so, in any device that you have, you have the stomatal conductance is always a calculation. Um, in our case, the way we uh, calculate stomatal conductance is, ba is uh, based on the transpiration, which is normalized to the plant biomass and to VPD, the vapor pressure deficit. Um, and this is the, uh, the measurement is the whole plant canopy stomatal conductance. Uh, this was verified many times by ourselves with Parameter, but not only with uh, other researchers. We have uh, publications where you can find the, the high correlation to Parameter. Uh, recently, Wachingen published a paper uh, using the system and uh, comparing it to Parameter with 0.99 correlation, so uh, in 0.95 into different experiments. So it's really very high correlation. And, uh, fully automated. Very nice. Congrats on that development. Taras uh, Pastanak is asking, did you add extra nut nutrition during uh, plant growth in the pots? And my addition would be, how is that uh, 
been realized in the planned array system? Okay, thank you for the question. So uh, yes, we have uh, uh, in the basic system, you can already uh, mix two different solutions. So you can have a nutrient uh, solution and uh, another one or two nutrient solution uh, mixed up. Uh, it could be biostimulant and uh, fertilizer, or it could be uh, with salinity or with drought. I mean, you can mix uh, two solutions, but not only two. You can actually uh, mix a lot of, uh, you know, it's unlimited. It's really based on the customer need. Um, and we can add more solutions to, to the system uh, quite easily. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can uh, mix uh, different solutions that were mixed before uh, the start of the experiment. Uh, so mixed already in the beginning, but also we can mix during the experiment. So it's very flexible. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Um, maybe directly following uh, on, up on that, is the plant array system just for drought stress or can it be also used for other kind of abiotic stresses? Definitely, every uh, abiotic stress that you can think of. The, first of all, the, the plant array system is measuring the plant response. So if you have a way beyond the soil water control that we do automatically, if you have a way to impact uh, also other parameters like CO2, like uh, light, like uh, humidity, whatever it is, in a growth chamber, for example, then we measure the plant response. This is uh, really the essence uh, to measure the plant uh, and the interaction with the environment. So yes, uh, we can do that. Uh, by the way, we, not only for abiotic stress um, stresses, so for example, by stimulant studies, the uh, nutrients, uh, but also biotic stresses, what we found out that with the system, you can very early, and this is very interesting for breeding companies, for example, very early uh, time-wise time um, in the process, really early detect uh, diseases, which is uh, because we measure the plant activity, no, how, not how it looks. Uh, when you usually you have uh, viruses or, or other type of diseases, fungi, et cetera, that you will see only the result after the disease developed. In our case, you can really um, uh, already very early in the process uh, uh, and it's like six to eight weeks before you can see something with the eye, you can already see the reduction in activity by the plant. Mm. So this is very interesting. This is because the, the system is targeting towards physiological or changes in physiological processes rather than uh, changes in the appearance, of course. Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, so what kind of uh, response parameters does the system allow you to quantify as a researcher? Can you give us a small um, rough tour? Yeah. Yeah, so we measure about 40 parameters overall, uh, plant and environment, but um, uh, the, I would focus on the main ones. Uh, it's transpiration uh, that I shown, uh, biomass gain by the plant, water use efficiency, the stomatal conductance, the root flux. We don't only measure the whole plant or the, on the canopy, but also the roots activity. Uh, it's sometimes very interesting to see the difference between the root and the shoot and understand why it, there is a difference. Uh, we also have, uh, are measuring automatically the plant resilience um, and, uh, and also the drought stress point, very unique parameters uh, that are usually very, very difficult. How do you know when the plant is really in stress? Uh, they always have some reserves of water, right? So how do you know he's in stress? This is really uh, a nice feature we have in the system. Uh, and uh, also uh, a lot of different parameters related to environment, the soil parameters, the environmental atmospheric uh, parameters like temperature and uh, humidity, VPD, uh, radiation, and more and more. So, uh... Let me quickly follow up a question on that going out to Alexis. So now you had two different um, 
phenotyping concept. So the one um, that was primarily done by Hyphen was, um, I think, image-based. Uh, please correct me uh, if I'm wrong. And as we have just heard from Karen, her system that was used in the greenhouse is mainly process-based or, or physiological process-based. So how or what challenges were there and how did you find a common ground between these two levels of, of, of observation? Uh, among this joint study? So, so actually, I, I think it's a little bit more, it's more fluent actually. Uh, and I think people are often confusing. People think that when we say high throughput phenotyping, we're just speaking about traits you can measure from an image or for a 3D point cloud. Actually, not at all. You, you need to go up to the functioning and you need to go up to understanding the processes that are making that the plant is having this uh, phenotype. So at Hyphen, uh, we're here from seven years. Indeed, we started like everyone by trying to figure out the how to compute the F cover, how to compute the LAI. Today, I think this is not research anymore. It's things that works, we can scale. Um, there's uh, many providers that can provide that. Of course, Hyphen is the best, but that's uh, needless to say. Um, but, but it's just the first step to be able to do something valuable about this data. This data and where I think researchers should focus is one more how to use and uh, give value to this data. And it needs to go into functional, um, into functions and to go into functions. So, so we, do, we believe that the next step is what we call agroclimatic traits, where we are completely into that, into this webinar with water use efficiency, but also with radiation use efficiency and others. And, and, and we will need to go further. And, and I do believe that uh, lysimeters, which is a uh, um, plan detect technology, but you also have other technologies uh, that can be in the field or, I, I, I mean, it, it's a wide range lysimeter is one way to better understand how the plant with its, uh, its, its, its outside um, characteristic is responding to, to, to draw it and to, and to water use. So, so, so I think it's really two technologies that are being combined together. I don't think we made a shift at all <laughs> in our strategy for the last seven years. We're not at all linked to a sensor. So, so Hyphen, other companies made the bet of being linked to a sensor. We made the bet to say, okay, sensors should be cheap. Uh, they should be used on other fields than just um, agriculture so that you can have it for, for, for reasonable price. And then we're going to work on the data processing because data processing is not research. Data processing is something scalable. It's something you should scale. It's something that should be cheap. And research is about how I'm using this data into uh, we're finding new processes and finding new ways to uh, to, to understanding plants, uh, how a plant is working and how we should um, go in, in genetic selections or others. Huh? And um, and I think what is really nice with the with webinar and what is really nice by collaborating with Planditech is that we're starting to put the pieces of the puzzles together. And, and we're really, uh, I'm open and Karen and I, I guess, to, to collaborate with as much people as possible to continue putting those pieces of the puzzles together, knowing that the role of Hyphen is to scale. Uh, my job is not to make uh, pure research. Huh? My job is to scale and to make sure that people stop hiring an university image scientist to make plan science when they should use the data that is already working for the last five years. And when I see people that are still trying to figure out how to have a proper F cover, it kills me or having how to have a proper free, what to do with a 3D point cloud. But we already know how to do what to do with a 3D point cloud. We're already using them. There's already people in, in, in big companies uh, selecting with those things. So you, you know that, that was what we were asking ourselves five to 10 years before. And, and so let's go forward uh, all together. Let's put all the pieces of the puzzles together because there's a lot and a lot and a lot of answer questions to answer still. And we're really, really excited to do that as a, as a community inside IPPN and with Planditech and, and with uh, anyone who wants to join. Yes, I think you have a very, very important point uh, that you very, very nicely framed uh, here. The plant phenotyping is uh, 
for first not an art, but it's also more than just taking pictures or um, extracting traits. It's what you do with this kind of information in order to answer questions which might ultimately help uh, this or that applicant or this in this or this application. And this uh, is a very, very powerful tool, um, but only if you use it right and you uh, picture this very nicely uh, in your talk, both of you, um, how, how to do this and to make use of the data in order to um, understand plants better and the plants reaction and of course to use this knowledge ultimately uh, to the advantage of, of the user or your clients uh, in these cases. Yeah, if I may add, uh, yes, what, we are, what we are doing is extracting data from sensor in order to create knowledge and this is the uh, also with plant eye tech this is the the the, the basic we we are trying to uh, uh, to to match the data for example between environment and plant but and and getting for example weight uh, data and uh, and the soil data, but this or that alone will not create knowledge. You need to, to extract from that. And with the technologies, with the, the technologies the, and the knowledge that it creates in terms of physiological terms, morphological terms in the case of uh, hyphen. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what we're trying to do. Okay. Exactly, nicely, nicely said. Um, so um, we'll we'll go on with the uh, Q and A. I have uh, one question from Avad uh, Sikufa, and she she's asking how can we get more information about your technologies uh, from Hyphen and Plant Dye Tech? Are these uh, so so? What kind of setups uh, variations are there? What do they cost? Do you have? Um, a, a representation in the US or do you distribute worldwide um, from, from Israel or from France? Uh, how can people make a connection to you? Um, so maybe I can uh, start We both and Plandetech and Hyphen has different representative in US. So um, it's really easy to join us in US and uh, Lee West and Catherine Jacobs. So Lee West for Hyphen and Catherine Jacobs for Plandetech. So, Please feel free to have more information on costs um, and, and expenses. And, and this will really depend, I guess, on your project. Uh, so, so it's always hard to give you some costs like that in a webinar uh, when we don't really have an idea of the scale of the project. I and mean, we can always uh, shoot out numbers like that, but it doesn't mean much. So, so but to all of you, uh, if you want to have ideas of cost for your project and what you're doing, uh, don't hesitate to reach to us to explain us what you're doing, how many fields you're having, etc. And we'll be very happy uh, to, to, to tell you uh, what type of cost we're speaking about. It's not the same cost when we're making one field with free elevation of drones for one very specific things, but when you're having 200 fields across 10 countries with 50 um, uh, pilots uh, flying drones, which some of our customer has, uh, well, they're necessarily the, the, the processing cost by unit is way lower but the, the, the contract is higher. So it, it, it really depends, it, it's so vast. Um, yeah. And if I may add, uh, you can find us, um, of course, on the digital uh, communications, if it's the website uh, with the name of our companies or uh, LinkedIn or, uh, uh, and of course, we have uh, both uh, scientific uh, articles that were published based on the technologies and the solution. Um, and uh, you can find the list of that uh, also on the website. Uh, we have customers, reference customers uh, that we can point out to you when we, you can find also some of them over the website, but you can also talk to us and we can direct you. Um, so there are many ways to learn about us and of course to contact us and uh, to have a chat and uh, we can discuss more and explain more. Excellent. <clears throat> so um, I'll have a couple of more questions. However, we need to also have a have a look on the time. So in that sense, um, Karen and Alexis, you are seeing what I'm seeing in the in the Q and A window. Do you have a, a, a 
from the from all the questions that are left um do you maybe identify one that uh, suits the you best or which you would like to answer um i think we can also kind of answer more briefly and of course if somebody wants to, to come back and uh, hear more you can come back i don't know about the time what is the time just a ch time check uh, philip well, I'm I'm fine. Uh, I was just okay. uh, taking uh, making a respect of your but, time and so maybe just I'm here all day. So, who is the next question? Maybe just if okay. you can direct us. The the next question would be: What is the minimum amount of plants you need to phenotype uh, a variety in your system in the greenhouse? Um, for example, what is or more more. Um, more uh, precisely, what is the variation within a population and the amount of plants you need to have sufficient power um, to see differences? I mean, this highly depends, of course, on the crop you are using and uh, the, the growth dynamics, but Karen, please. Yeah, so it mainly depends on the growth facility and on the, um, also on the experiment type, what treatment you would like to do. So if you are in, a, let's say, a very unified uh, environment, you can even have only four repeats for each plant, um, and this will be good enough. Uh, or you can have, um, you know, if it's more uh, distributed, then you have uh, less unified, you will have um, six will be okay. And But if you do, for example, biostimulant type of test, you would need more than, Six, we will recommend to have a bit more just to be on the safe side. So uh, to be like with eight repeats or so, or even more. It, it really also depends on the customers. Some customers want to be, you know, very, very safe. So they will uh, go with higher numbers. Uh, but this is from our experience and we have vast experience. This is what we see. As a rule of thumb, you can also um, say in general, the smaller the signal you want to, to get, uh, the, the more comfortable and the more, more successive it will be uh, to have a higher number of replicates, of course. Uh, if the, the effect size... Yes, is but, even for, yeah, but even with the stimulants, for example, you can have still very few. I mean, it's, you don't need to have tens of uh, repeat, right? It's not a field test. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that, that's the benefit of working in a, in a very, very um, closed environment, yeah, that you have quite a, a good hold on, on what kind of effect size. In any case, um, the recommendation would be to do some pre-trials in order to uh, check how your system is, is uh, developing and what to expect in what uh, amount of time for which parameter, certainly. Yeah, and I will, uh, will also have, uh, add that what helps a lot is the randomization we have because uh, we can randomize the structure, then you have more unified, you know, you have the statistics is more uh, scattered around the, the, the experiment. So this is also helping to minimize <coughs> the number of repeats. <coughs> Thank you. Have you ever tried to apply biotic stresses? I think, um, yeah. No, we discussed uh, that. Answer. <laughs> like certain bugs that are put on the plant. I imagine it's quite quite difficult, but not impossible. So, yeah, exactly. you answered. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I no, should... that's right. You gave a good answer. That's fine. <laughs> simply, simply shut up and let you speak. No, 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 go ahead, Philip. <laughs> How many plants can we measure with one plant array system? Okay, so the, the, the amount of plants is determined by the number of treatments you want to do and the, by the, the type of experiment as we just discussed before. So this will determine the, the, so the size of the system uh, that you want as a minimum. So uh, I would say you can start even with, with eight if the greenhouse is uh, unified, only eight units. Uh, so it really depends on, again, the growth facility, the distribution of conditions, uh, and the type of experiment you, you want to do. 
Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, so Oliver is asking, I was wondering if you use for the greenhouse tests the same soil as in the field or do you design uh, a tailor-made substrate trying to mimic field soil conditions? No, no, we use the, the type of soil that the customer wants to use. Uh, it doesn't need to have any uh, modifications. Um, and you need to, based on the type of soil, uh, you need how you, you, like in every experiment, doesn't uh, not relate on the, only to a plant array system. You have to know the, the parameters of the soil that you're using and based on that to design the experiment. So it's, um, but we, we basically, the, the system is uh, versatile to plant type, soil type, so growth, different growth stages, so there is no problem. Thank you. How, uh, Tim Chiles asks, how does biology factor? Are the bacterial and fungal communities, biodiversities, quant quantities being measured? <laughs> oh, that's, that's complicated to read. Uh, and fungal community biodiversity quantities being measured? qualitatively as uh, quantitatively. So did you uh, factor in any um, soil-borne bacterial or fungal um, differences within both field trials where they were um, definitely um, uh, abundant or in your, in your greenhouse experiments? Did they find any uh, inclusion in terms of a factor inside the experimental design? Alex, do you want to? Yeah, well, the answer is clearly no. We haven't measured anything like that. So this is a uh, next level. And I must admit, I'm not very clear on how to do that in a high throughput way and to see on how it's going to um, uh, dynamically and if it, it varies from one micro plot or the other, or, for, or if it's just the same across your trail and thus uh, it's not a factor that will differentiate your modalities. I, I, I don't know, I'm not clear at all and I don't know how to measure that for sensors. So the answer is no, but it's definitely probably the next generation of uh, typing. I hope we'll be able to, to present in a couple of years from now. Thank you. Um, so from our perspective, uh, uh, whatever is, um, uh, you can implement through the solution, it's handled automatically, full automatically by the system. So if you can apply it through the solution, uh, we can handle it. Uh, and what we measure is the plant response, of course. Um, so this is, uh, can you hear me? Because I got a message, internet line is unstable. All good. For some reason. We, okay. we read you very clearly. Okay. So this is my answer. Whatever we we can uh, uh, control by the solution, we control it as fully automatic. Uh, you can do different uh, concentrations, different quantities that you apply uh, differently to different solutions, and uh, we apply it automatically or to mix it even within the system. But um, and all the rest is uh, we measure the plant response in any case. Thank you. Uh, Michael Bartsch is asking, do contracted research organizations use your system? Currently? Yes, of course. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And with, drone, and with drones as well, we, we start to have some decent contract with them. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's coming in. Yeah, for, we have customers like that. For the people that are not using yet drones or, or phenotyping, it's time to get interested because, indeed, um, people are using it more and more and if zeros start to use it it means that there is interest from their customers yes and especially cro's i mean that's their core business yeah uh, sensing how how plants react towards different uh, products towards uh, different different kind of stress situations um, sometimes but also just uh, regular growth monitoring uh, can be facilitated very, very well. And that should be, uh, in, in my personal opinion, of course, of high interest because it, uh, it is. goes down to, to what they are doing essentially. 
Yeah. So especially for CROs, plant phenotyping is uh, an approach they they can they can directly turn into business. I think. Yep, and it's happening. And it's happening exactly. So both both of you say uh, that control research organizations are already using your services on and products so uh, uh, uh sure yes on that yeah it's a sure yes and of course we would love them to use them more and we would love to have more business but it's it's, it's already starting and it's already starting strong and i think it's it's uh, it's quite new i mean it's it's really uh, yeah take it take it um one of the last questions now um, coming. Uh, so B, uh, Keith Neo is uh, um, catching up on, on um, his or her last questions. Just now, Karen mentioned about root flux. Is it by calculation based on water use efficiency or is there a sensor to measure uh, root fluxes? So we are uh, using it, doing it with the help of a soil sensor, uh, but it's also the way the technology is built up. So both the contribution of the soil sensor together with how we uh, we have the system set up that you can measure the root uh, influx. Thank you very much. So that sums up um, our, our Q&A for today. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this very very interesting presentation but also afterwards the q a was very very fun actually and i think uh, you provided valuable information to to everyone of our uh let me quickly see um almost 90 90 um people uh, audience size um for the peak of the the webinar uh, just before i close um where will we see you, uh, Karen and, and Alexis, in the future? Are there any conferences, exhibitions where Plant Dietech and Hyphen will maybe um, take uh, part together? I mean, you recently joined the, the IPPN um, together. So, with sure. the, yeah, we'll thank you. Symposium in June, so, 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 but, but maybe before, because this is still very far away. Uh, mm -hmm. We will be together at the BOSS team in Florida, we'll be together at PAG, a plant and animal genome in San Diego. Hyphen will be at ASTA in Chicago in December as well. Uh, we will be at NAPPN uh, as well, and uh, probably others, which I forget. So, so don't hesitate to watch our website, both websites. Uh, sometimes we have stand together, sometimes we don't. But, but in any case, you're really, really more than welcome to come and uh, reach us and, and we're really excited to see all the IPPN community in Wageningham uh, hopefully without a mask <laughs> but even if I'm starting to have doubts about that <laughs> we can have hopes yes uh, yeah what what Alexi is speaking of is the international plant phenotyping symposium that is going to happen uh, end of next year so still a lot of time uh, in between to get um uh, in contact with karen or alexis with hyphen or uh, plant dietech uh, feel free if you experience any um challenges doing doing that getting in contact feel also free to to write me an email and i will gladly uh channel this through to to uh whoever it uh, it targets thank you very much once again um and uh, for everybody who was not uh, able to see the full video, um, I will cut it thoroughly. So to account a little bit for the problems we've had in the beginning um, and then later launch it to our YouTube channel. You will get a notification through our uh, IPPN social media accounts. Uh, feel free to like and sub subscribe to these if you want to stay tuned on developments and news around plant phenotyping. And uh, it was a pleasure to host you both. And uh, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful day until next time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you everyone. And thank you, Philip. And thanks to the audience for great questions. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.